Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see so many people here knowing that we have competition from two other rooms, so I can confirm to you that you made the right choice, so be welcome. I have a whole bunch of papers here, but I don't want to scare anybody, so I don't intend to read all of it. Instead, I'd rather just tell you what I want to tell you. Um, I won't introduce myself. I will just, uh, for those who may be uh, less familiar with Godin, I will just mention to you that this is, we are the grandchild of an idea that came out of the G8 in 2012-2013, where at that time some one of those brilliant people thought that it would be a good idea to put together ag and nutrition information that could be useful to Africa. Uh, Africa was chosen, I guess, because this is where most of the, the world's demographic increase is likely to come over the, the next few decades. But the concept started there, and then in the following two, three years before the Secretariat emerged in 2015, the concept became not just a north-south approach, but also a north-north, south-south, and why not south-north approach as well. So it became more of a concept of exchanging knowledge, innovation, ideas uh, together on a global scale. Uh, what I want to show you, uh, because I think that it's too easy to talk about open data. Open data is what we're all about. Uh, GoDan means the Global Open Data Initiative for Agriculture and Nutrition. But when you think of open data, people think of binary numbers and big computers, and you can already hear the click uh, of the, the, the computer gears turning on, while in reality, open data is really people. That's what it's all about. It's about people, it's about societies, it's about mentalities. So I would like this, this morning in the few minutes that I have to help us all collectively sort of visualize a little bit what we mean by open data and, and how we can uh, use it to our advantage to face many challenges that we have ahead, especially the food security challenge that is coming up. But beyond that, by addressing in the wise way, in a smart way, the, uh, the food security challenge, we can also contribute not only to generate more food, but also to generate more wealth so that we have a well, better fed world, but also a wealthier world. Um, this reflects some of the challenges we have ahead. We, you know, uh, every 50 years or so, if I go back 50 years in time, there was about 3 billion people on this planet. So you have to visualize a planet of 3 billion and then beside it, there's planet B with another 3 billion people which have no place to go except on planet A. So we move these guys in, so we double the population using the same resources that were there because we don't have a spare planet for those guys. So now we're 6 billion. And we're in a situation today where about 75% of the fish stocks worldwide are either fully exploited or overexploited. Countries are like the ones in Africa on average, 70 to 90% of the fresh water available already goes to agriculture, and yet we have another planet C worth of people coming, another 3 billion people. The other day I was uh, talking with a colleague. He said, hey, what's the big deal? We've been working with the MDGs for a, a couple decades now, and we managed to bring about half the people that were mal under malnutrition out of malnutrition. So if you do a simple calculation, we're 6 billion people, Mm, the ratio went from 23 to around 12 percent, let's say 20 to 10 to make calculations easier. So that means that we took 6 million people out of malnutrition. That's pretty good, one would say. But let's not forget there is still another six mi 600 million out there that needs to be processed. The message that this guy was trying to tell me is give it another 15 years and these guys will be okay. But then he's forgetting the 3 billion more that are coming. So what that means is that in the next 15, 20 years, or 30 years, if you will, we will have to do six times more than what we just did over the last two decades just to feed the additional people coming and those that were left behind in the first effort. This is a little bit what this, uh, what this slide comes up. It also shows that while we're trying to do that to improve yields and, and generate more food, and by the way, not just generate more food, but generate more food where the food should be, or making sure that the food that we generate moves to where it's most needed. So that adds to the complexity of this. Uh, but while we're trying to do that, we have obstacles coming up, global warming being one of them. Demographics complicate things, but global warming means that if we weren't to do anything, just or to continue just doing exactly the same as we're doing now, we'd be producing less and less because it's becoming harder and harder to produce because of the climate change. So we need to adapt to that. 
Now, I'll try to be a bit faster so I don't stress out our moderators. Um, this picture is, uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit uh, distorted because I didn't fit on my slide, but the idea is there. This is a picture of what the Earth would look like if you were in space somewhere right now looking at it. You'd see a whole bunch of things flying around, uh, debris, parts of old satellites, existing satellites, uh, military satellites, although they're not supposed to exist, but there, there's, a, there's some, something like that there. Um, the message here is that in 2025, that's nine years from now, there's going to be over 1,000 satellites, official satellites, scanning the Earth and sending back information about the Earth. That does not include, of course, uh, satellites that are looking at space or the non-existing military satellites, so it's only the other ones. 1,000 satellites scanning the Earth and sending back data. So what that tells me is that there's no shortage of data if you look at satellites, because there are, of course, tons of other sources of data. But when I look at this, I think this is a mess. You know? And it's also a reflection of, of the way data is managed in this world. It's, it's really managed like a mess. My, when my daughter was young, uh, not so long ago, I hope, I like to think, I, I was trying to explain her how to keep her room tidy because I was telling her, you know, the condition of your room shows me the condition of your head. So if your room is a mess, it means your mind is a mess. So, and when I see this, I say, gee, we have a problem. But this is why we're here, to address this problem. I won't talk about precision agriculture or satellite too much because the pre my uh, predecessor here did it much better than I could. But what I want to say is to, with this slide here is to give you a little bit of the flavor of Godan. Godan, as you will see, is a network. We're, we're knowledge brokers, really. That's what we are. We put people together and get them to share their ideas, their skills, their competence in new ways, innovative ways, and then come up with new things that maybe were not thought of before or were not done before because these people never spoke to each other. So, and and this, there's an illustration of that in a way. While we can get all kinds of information coming from satellites, um, that's what that slide is. Let's, let's just take the simplest one, weather data. Weather data is the most commonly used uh, satellite imagery coming, so you, you, we can predict uh, the weather. But uh, per se, it's not enough. What is interesting is if you can combine this information with other information, like if you can compare with historical agricultural production or diseases or other phenomenons that helped or impeded agriculture, then you can make correlations and say, based on the forecast that we have for weather in this coming summer in your part of the world, we're saying that you're more at risk of infestation of this or of that, so therefore you can be better prepared to address the potential problem coming up and therefore help decrease the damage or even increase your yields. So that's, that's what we do in Godan. We try to get people with different sources of information to put it together into a new innovation that benefits everyone. So that's, that's the concept behind Godan. Uh, now, ah. And the way we do that is basically, you don't need to read that, just trust me. So the way we do that is that we put together. We organize all kinds of events. Either we organize them ourselves, or we come and participate to events like this one, where after explaining what we do, we try to get people, and normally people contact us a little bit, or, or they check our websites, godan.info, godan.info, and because it's free anyway, so it's uh, not a big deal. And, and then it explains how you can, you can integrate yourself or your organization in this broader network. I used to tell my colleagues, I still do, that no matter how good your presentation may be, when people leave the room, you, have, you must have in mind that they're going to remember about 10% of what you're going to say. So if you remember only 10% of what I'm saying today, please remember that part. Our message is that together we are stronger than by ourselves. So we have to, and I'll, I'll repeat that later, we have to overcome a mentality blockage that we all have we being not just the users, the governments, the researchers, the scientists, the IT people, me. We have to collectively overcome that so that we finally, we let the, somebody said yesterday, yesterday, let the data free. That's maybe the message. So we do that through all these workshops that we organize or that we contribute to. 
relying on three main pillars, which are research, partnership, and impact. Research is no good if it has no impact or if it's just to make a researcher happy or some funder happy because they did something. It's only useful if it has an impact. And it's only really useful if it has an impact that is such that the research or the effort in the application of the research is going to be sustained because the benefits will be sustained as well. This is or was go down three days ago. I started that when I joined in September. So the, the, the Secretariat is kind of young, but uh, as we speak now, we're around 212 partners because it's changing every day. Yesterday, we got three more, which were the state of Brazil, Colombia, and Nigeria. Because as you probably cannot see, because the, the more partners we get, the tinier the, the icons are. Um, we have a whole range of people in there. There are governments, there are research institutions, uh, universities, private companies, anything from IBM to FAO or, or to in, from INRA to some to ESOCO in, in Africa. So they're all in there because they all have things that they want to put together or learn from each other in order to do their business better. Remember the 10%? I'm going to finish on that slide. Not right now, I have a couple more things to say, very short. But my last slide is going to be that one, because that's what Godin is all about, and that's our message, really. What Godin is, it's a network of networks. It's not just one network where everybody talks, but within our network, because of the diversity of our members, there tends to be groups that emerge that are focusing on statistics, or that are focusing on fertilizers, or on precision agriculture, or on nutrition. So. And, and yet, by doing that, these networks find that the other network also has something that is of interest. So that's why I say Godin is a network of networks. And that's the slide I would like you to please, please, please remember after this. Now I'm losing track as to where I am in my papers. I apologize to the translators. Uh, yeah, you already know my name, so I guess it's not that page. Uh, the purpose of this slide over here was to insist on the fact that open data, is, and there's a whole discussion around raw data because there's, of course, a moral issue that comes up, which is practical in a way. If you're a research center, you tend to generate data that is at its first phase kind of raw. So it comes out in, in big numbers, which you can't do much with it unless you, you have the means to put specialists that can interpret, to interpret your data and, and make something meaningful or useful to your, for, to your purpose. So that's why I say open data is not just data. You ha it has to be massaged in a way that it becomes information. And that with this information, you it can be transmitted and becomes knowledge. And, when, and no innovation and knowledge are really the ultimate objective of producing data or producing research, isn't it? And hopefully, when we have all of that, we're going to improve our collective wisdom which is the philosophical part of my presentation here. So. so pitfalls. There are many pitfalls out tons. We could talk about it the whole day, but they're not unsurmountable. The three classic ones we see is when people think of open data as a com that's for the computer guys, you know. But I'll tell you one thing, that if open data was just a computer issue, it would have been solved a long time ago. Open data is not a computer issue. It's a social issue. So that's the, the message of that first one. And then we often think of outdated business models like, no, it's my data, and it's worth a lot of money, and nobody's going to touch it unless I get paid for it. Well, there are so many new models that, of course, you have to recoup your investment. Open data is not free. No data is free. Somebody has to pay to produce it. But there are many ways to generate benefits that in the short or longer run will offset the cost of producing the data in the first place. And the third one is I just made a reference to is to start with data instead of issues. In one of my previous incarnations, I was uh, running, uh, uh, I was in a big organization, and it, it really sat, and it was a knowledge-based organization, one that really produces global knowledge and something. And uh, what saddened me is that every year we had to throw away literally tons, tons of books that nobody would read. So except maybe a small group of top-level scientists, which were the only ones to understand what was written in the book. So, uh, but I guess it made these guys happy, but it sure didn't make me happy. 
and it didn't make much sense or use to anybody else. So the third pit pitfall is to start with what could, we, what could we do today instead of looking at what kind of problems do we have? And, and, and then go backwards from the problem up to the solution, which probably has something to do with research, but not the other way around. It sounds obvious, doesn't it? But then why aren't we doing it? Part of human nature, maybe. And then here, I have a whole bunch of challenges. So I won't read them all. I think you, you can read better than I can. So I'll just make sure that this, uh, that this um, presentation is available. But there's a lot of uh, obstacles to sharing data and sharing information. And a lot of it has to do with perception. People fear that if they open up their knowledge base to other people, it's going to put them at a disadvantage either a political disadvantage because others will know what our problems are or at a competitive disadvantage because maybe somebody will take advantage of that against me. Well, I'll tell you uh, one example uh, of this. In, uh, in a country where I work right now, there is every year a quarter of a million people that get sick because they eat chicken. Not because chicken is bad for you, but because it's of the way it's processed, handled, and you know, between the chicken farm and the fork. Uh, there's a number of steps where things can, can go wrong. And sometimes they do, and quite a lot, because we're talking of a quarter of a million people, and that country is in Europe, by the way, so it's not a, an underdeveloped country uh, in any way. And what's interesting is that there are five main companies in that country that handle chicken, five of them. And each of them would tell you that they have the solution for it, so that their chicken is perfect, so there's no need to talk to anybody about it, they're okay. However, what they forget is that every now and then the problem pops up. And if it's not your company today, it can be tomorrow. And even if it's never your company, if it's the other guy's company and he has a problem and it goes in the press, people will stop buying chicken, all chicken, including yours. So why not put our solutions together so that we protect the whole industry? And by doing that, you're not gaining or losing an advantage or a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis your competitors. You're making everybody stronger. That's the, the, the whole concept. And then, am I at the last slide? Yeah, well, that was supposed to be my, my last slide, but I'll, I'll leave the previous one on. What we say you should do is first, my goal, our goal, is that within the next five years, we would like to convince enough people so that open data becomes the de facto standard, the normal thing to do. That when you, you produce knowledge and you produce data, you make it available. That's the goal. You know. I understand that for all kinds of security, commercial and whatever, it may not happen the first day. But at least that should be the direction where you're going. Make it meaningful. Raw data is interesting for a few people, but for most it's not. What is really interesting is, is if this raw data is translated into an application, something that people can use day to day to improve the way they do agriculture or the way they manage nutrition. And that gap is oftentimes not there. The head of one of the largest European research institutions was telling me two weeks ago, you know, the problem we have is that our really best researchers are our top ones. They're really excellent, outstanding in their field, but my God, they're bad communicators. We just don't understand what they're saying. So it's like a mini club talking a secret language in some way. So what we have to do is either train them into becoming better communicators or have an intermediary that, that can translate this data, this knowledge, into something practical. So... That's, so so that, that's, that's, my, that's my message there. And finally, remember sustainability. Whatever you do, think as to what's going to happen when funding runs out. So you have to f implement something in a way that the benefits will be sufficient to encourage the end users to invest themselves in continuing, uh, continuing the effort after your time is done, like mine is right now, so I'm going to try to press this button. That was the nice slide I had at the end in all kinds of languages saying thank you, but I'd rather just say thank you. <laughs>